Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And before we get started today, Bryce and I wanted to talk a little bit about Institute. With the upcoming school year starting, we would like to encourage everyone to get Institute on your radar and sign up for a class. There's a whole bunch of misunderstandings that Mike and I would like to correct. One of those is... If I'm a young adult, do I have to pay money to take an institute class? And the answer is no. All the courses are free. Another question that students often ask or they wonder about is, okay, let's say I go to a class and after a couple days, I really don't like the class. Then what? Find one that you do. Yeah, we're okay with that. We all acknowledge that our teaching styles may not resonate with each student. Therefore, find something that does resonate. We all teach differently, and if your learning style doesn't match the teaching style of the teacher, we hope that you still come to Institute, take a different class from a different teacher. You can choose a class, a subject, and a teacher that fits your specific needs. Another misunderstanding is what if I'm late coming into the semester, like I'm coming home from a mission in the middle of the semester, or I have a job or something comes up and I can't complete the whole semester. We say come anyway. This isn't really a credit-oriented system where you, if you can't complete, you're going to fail the class. Just come for when you can. If you can only make the last six weeks, great. If you can only make the first couple of classes, fantastic. Our job is to just help serve you and connect you with heaven. So if you are a college student, or if you have a son or a daughter that's a college-age student, or perhaps you have a grandson or a granddaughter who's college-age student, then we would encourage all of you to encourage them to sign up for an institute class. We have online classes. We have in-person classes. We have institutes all over the world adjacent to almost every single college and university. Mike and I teach at the institute adjacent to the University of Utah. If any of you come into our institute, we'd love you to swing by and say hello. Yeah, pop in for a class. We'd love to see you. And so with that, we're going to start now talking about the Psalms. We're actually going to be in the third set of the Psalms this week. Uh, For those of you that haven't heard the previous two, we would encourage you to go back and listen to those. This section of Come Follow Me is going to cover Psalms 102 to 150. Now, before Mike jumps into that, just in case this is your first podcast with Talking Scripture and you haven't joined us previously, in the previous two podcasts on Psalms, we established the setting of the Psalms. Modern scholarship, as well as church scholarship, have all kind of agreed that the ancient Israelites had a temple ceremony. Not necessarily an individual one like we have today, but a group ceremony, a festival. And it was associated with the the beginning of the year, the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would gather and they would have this days-long ceremony. It's that setting that we believe is the backdrop of the Psalms, that these Psalms come out of different portions of that ceremony. So those of you who have been to a modern-day temple should recognize a lot of the themes and ideas that you find in the Psalms because they are just dripping with temple imagery and temple covenants. I think that's a good intro, Bryce. It's good to have a little bit of background, especially for those of you that haven't heard us before. So thank you for reminding all of us what's going on. So before we jump into Psalm 102, I just want to pay homage to a couple of the Psalms that we skipped because last week in Come Follow Me, it ended in 86, and so we're skipping 87 through 101. But I want to talk a little bit about Psalm 89. So I think one of the things that is happening in Psalm 89 is it's talking about God's power in creation. So look in verse 10. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. Skip down to verse 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. I think one of the ways we can read these verses is God's power of creation. Rahab is this personification of Leviathan uh, or the personification of the chaos dragon. God has defeated the forces of chaos and established truth, and he is our king. That's verse 18. And then we skip to verse 20 through 23, where it talks about. David's kingship. Remember, anciently, David, or the king, whoever the king was, was a son of David. The king represented to the people 
God's chosen servant, and that when the king was righteous, the land would be whole, and the king would make covenants at the fall festival, and that's the setting of life we think is happening here with the Psalms. And so the king would make these covenants, and then he would be anointed king. And as this was going on, then the people would also have those promises extended to them. The men and women could become kings and priests unto God as David, or whoever the king was, and his spouse were made king and queen. So with that in mind, go to verse 20. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. My arm shall also strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. This is a promise of invulnerability. This is a promise that the king has been anointed with the holy oil. In fact, the word Messiah or Christ, whether we're reading this in Hebrew or Greek, that is one who has been anointed. And so this is a promise that the king who has been anointed will be strengthened with the arm of God. And then go to verse 29 of section 89. It says, his seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. And then it says, verse 36 of Psalm 89, his seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon. And so there's this promise to the descendants of the king that the seed will continue. This is a promise of children and posterity. And remember, this isn't just to the king. This is to you. These are temple promises. Now, the back end of Psalm 89 is lament. And verse 39 talks about, thou hast made void the covenant. Verse 40, thou hast broken down all his hedges. How long, O Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? That's Psalm 89, 46. Remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servants. So that's verse 50. So in the midst of this, in the midst of this promise of God's loving kindness and how he's going to bless him, there's also this lament that the king has been forsaken. And if you think about Christ, he really is the embodiment of these images. Christ's throne is as the sun, verse 36. But he is also, I mean, we can read Psalm 89 this way. This is also a Psalm prophetic of Jesus. But what about our lives? I mean, those that keep temple covenants have those same experiences. We have tragic things happen to us. We experience loss. And yet in the midst of this, we have verse 36 and 37. So I think the gold of Psalm 89, like I love the creation stuff. I love talking about Rahab. But I think the gold of this stuff are those key promises In verse 34, 35, 36, 37, the promise of the seed is beautiful, and it's drenched in temple imagery. Now, we've mentioned this before, but allow a brief repetition if any of you are new. The Latter-day Saints have an advantage as we examine this, because these psalms have been scattered, and they've been mixed up in their order. But because we have a modern temple ceremony, and because we understand the plan of salvation, and because we have the Book of Mormon as a standard, we can put them back in order and understand a great deal about that temple festival. But that being said, I want to point out that so many of these psalms have at its backdrop a basic understanding of the plan of salvation that when we sing out a celebration or we sing out a lament, it's because we understand the basics of the plan of salvation. That's where the Book of Mormon becomes so valuable, that if you sang that lament in Psalm 89, you would have in the back of your mind Second Nephi chapter 2 with an understanding of mortality and opposition and why this earth in its present condition is necessary. So I think it's crucial that Latter-day Saints keep in mind everything that we know about the plan of salvation as we study these things, that when there's a victory psalm or when there's a lament psalm, all of those have to be fit into the plan of salvation, which requires opposition in all things. It requires a fallen mortal world in which we do experience pain in order to have joy. So that's why I love the position we're in and we have the Book of Mormon. Excellent. Okay, before we get to 102, let's look at Psalm 93. It's really short, but I think it's worth reading. The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. 
The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are sure, holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Now, there's lots of ways to read this, but what what we think is going on here is that the Lord, represented by his holy ark, is entering the temple in a solemn procession. And it means that he is now coming into Jerusalem as the victorious king and the conqueror of all evil powers. The fact that he's there, that the Lord has come to the temple, it really means that the earth is once more firm in spite of the furious uproar of the primeval ocean. The earth is once more as it was created in the beginning, where the waters have been split. And this is indicative of so many stories in the Bible. Probably my most favorite is the story of Moses splitting the sea. And so as the Lord reigns and he is mightier than the waters and the floods have lifted up, and in essence, where it says the floods lift up their waves in verse three, what we see is that God is splitting the sea and he's creating Israel through the chaos. And in essence, it's all of us. When we go through the waters of baptism, God splits the sea and we come out a new creature. That's right. We even see it with the Jaredites. They split the sea in those vessels and they come to a new land. I mean, this is Nephi's story. Nephi builds a boat and they come across the waters. Now, that theme of overcoming the darkness, overcoming the dragon, overcoming the seas, overcoming chaos flows all throughout history and the plan of salvation. We saw it in creation. Overcoming the darkness of the uncreated is one thing. We see it all over. We see it in the temple drum of ancient Israel. And one of the places of significant interest to us that we see it is in the idea of apostasy, that the earth fell into a universal darkness and that the earth had chaos reigning on it, and that the restoration pierces that darkness and restores truth to the earth. And so it's not a coincidence that we find in the Psalms a reference to our story. We saw one of those last week. We're going to start this week with another one, a reference to Zion being rebuilt and ending the chaos of the apostasy, that God is victorious over the dragon and the monster. So we start off in Psalm 102, and we start with this lament as if we're in a dark place, like the apostasy, like chaos. And then this promise in verse 13, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. I love the wording there because it makes it sound like we've known this was coming, and we've all along had a plan to end the chaos. The set time to end the apostasy, to bring about the restoration, has come. That God has known this is in the works from the beginning. And then he continues in verse 16, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. So one reference you got to find in the Psalms is your place in earth's history. That we are, we, the Latter-day Saints, have come before the end to conquer the dragon of the apostasy and bring light back to the earth. The imagery of the restoration is that we are coming out of the wilderness and we are coming into the light. You'll find that all throughout the Doctrine and Covenants. And we're referenced again in the Psalms. It really is a lament in in 102. It's also a prayer. It starts with, hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me. Now, that's the front end. That's the very first couple of verses in Psalm 102. Now, I know that Psalm 115 is being skipped in this week's Come Follow Me, but I want to just draw your attention to it because in Psalm 115, we actually see some more of the things that are happening in 102. During the Feast of Tabernacles drama, The people who awaited the Savior were those Israelites who had symbolically died with their king in this final battle. Remember, this is a drama, and in the drama, the king is going to die and then come back to life, and this is foreshadowing the Savior. So these people that are now in this space of they're not alive anymore, they anticipate the Savior's coming to rescue them from death and hell. And in Psalm 115, we hear two groups of voices. We hear first the Israelites and then their enemies. So look in verse 1. This is the Israelites speaking. 
Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Now we go to verse 2, and these are the taunting ones, the heathens that are taunting the Israelites. Verse 2 says, Wherefore should the heathens say, Where now is their God? And then the Israelites respond in Psalm 102, and they they respond all the way down from verse 3 to 16. I'm not going to read it all, but it's beautiful, and it's in poetic style. If you go to the show notes, we actually break it down where you can read it as poetry. But essentially, they say, God is in the heavens, and the heathens are not going to win. Verse 9 says, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is the help in their shield. And over and over again, it's this message of trust and that the Lord is with them. But then the heathen comes back in verse 17 of Psalm 115 and says, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. You see, there's this tension in the ancient tradition that the dead can't praise the Lord. This question of, well, what do the dead do? Can they praise God? Are they even aware? And there's a few verses in the Old Testament that hint that, yes, they do praise the Lord. And then we have resurrection material when we get to Daniel, and I'm going to propose that there are some texts in Isaiah that have indications that Isaiah believed in a resurrection. But that was a question that some of these ancients had. I think Ezekiel clearly believed in a resurrection because at least he saw the resurrection of Israel patterned after the resurrection of individual bodies. So there's some clear evidence there that resurrection was a real thing. And I love that, Mike, because that's another example of conquering the chaos, conquering the dragon. Jacob in the Book of Mormon refers to death and hell as the awful monster. And every one of us have fought that monster. We've watched a loved one use every ounce of modern technology and modern medicine to fight back that monster. But in the end, that monster always wins. No one of us can conquer the monster. But then Jesus comes along, and the great victory of a Redeemer is that he conquered the awful monster. And so you kind of get that theme of people are kind of mocking us for being conquered by the monster, but we know that Christ will conquer that monster. I think that's what's happening here in Psalm 115. You see, when the heathen say that the dead praise not the Lord in verse 17, neither any that go down in silence, the Israelites' response in verse 18 is, We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. And then you get to Psalm 102. And although they're in the underworld, they are as yet only appointed unto death. That's verse 20. Their death was not permanent. For in the drama, at least, there seems to be this window of hope for the dead. And they're praising God, but yet they're in this space of being in the underworld. Go to verse 19. We're in Psalm 102 now. He has looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from the heaven did the Lord behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed unto death. So we see God in verse 19 in his sanctuary. Remember, the temple on earth seemed to be a prototypical replication of the temple in heaven. So as the temple in heaven had ordinances and had God, we also had a temple on earth, which was its replica. So we have God in verse 19 looking down and he sees the prisoner, those appointed unto death. We'll see that idea in Isaiah 61 and section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants, that the spirits that are in Sheol are appointed unto death or they're prisoners. And then it says in verse 21, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. Skip down to verse 26. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. All of them shall wax old like a garment as a vesture, shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. There seems to be an indication in verse 28 that the plea of these individuals is that their seed will continue. But I would say, I think you can also read this as the Lord saying that he knows who they are and that they will continue. So Psalm 102 ends with this mention of offspring, this promise of progeny. And I think that, once again, we're back to that idea that the continuation of the seeds is very much part of the temple drama and very much, I would say, as a Latter-day Saint, connected to my ties to Jesus. That, to me, the Lord says, Mike... If you keep the covenant, the seeds will continue, that your family will be blessed. 
Now, keeping with that theme, let's jump to 116, which comes right after 115. So we don't mean to confuse you, but we're starting in 102 that talks about this theme of overcoming chaos, the darkness, the dragon. And there's a clear reference to death being that dragon and that darkness that we overcome, which led us to 115, and now it's going to lead us to 116. So stay with us for a second. We'll get back to 103. We're kind of jumping around. Move around. but We, one apo- we six- apologize. 116 kind of picks up that idea of conquering over the ultimate chaos, the ultimate dragon, the awful monster, and that's death. So in verse 3 of 116, he starts with, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell gat hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Now, that's an understatement for everyone who has lost someone they dearly love, a child, a companion. And part of what adds to that darkness is there seems to be this helplessness. I can't get them back, and I miss them. And so the plea we all pray to God in verse 4 is, Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. And then verse 8, beautifully stated in verse 8, Someday every one of us will say, whether your darkness and chaos was sin, whether it was apostasy and you're wondering if truth will be restored on earth, whether that darkness and the monster was death, and the loss of a loved one, we will all proclaim someday, thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I won't fall anymore. I won't weep anymore. I won't weep for the loss of someone I love anymore. Someday, somewhere, because of a Redeemer, we will all sing that song. I got to say it again. Thou hast redeemed my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. It's like that beautiful verse in Revelation 21, 4, that God will wipe away all tears from off their eyes, and there shall be no more sorrow, nor death, nor crying. And I think we can add falling. There will be no more falling because the former things have passed away. There's a beautiful moment at the death of Lazarus in John chapter 11, where Jesus waits deliberately, knowing that he would be dead four days. When he gets there, his two sisters come out weeping, Martha and Mary. He has an interesting conversation with Martha. Martha says, if you'd been here, you could have saved him. She does know that he will rise in the resurrection, but that is a day so far off that it doesn't comfort her soul today. And Jesus says in this beautiful and yet rushingly powerful moment, I am the resurrection and the life who will resurrect us from all of the darkness that we face, all of the chaos. And someday, because of him, Someday we will all shout out, Thou hast delivered my soul from death, as well as the soul of everyone that I love. Now, speaking of death, as long as we're in Psalm 116, there is a powerful doctrine taught about the death of the saints, the death of righteous people. And we have to turn to the Book of Mormon because it's been lost from the Bible, but the idea of progression as taught in the Book of Mormon is grace for grace, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how we move forward. We don't achieve salvation in leaps and bounds. It's in small little steps consistently taken over a long period of time. And if we're in that process— Nephi gives a marvelous phrase. If you're a longtime listener of Talking Scripture, you've heard me quote this many times, and I'm not ashamed of that. I'm going to quote it many more because it's a promise we all need to hear. In 2 Nephi chapter 31, verse 20, Nephi says, now notice whose name is on this promise. I cannot find that anywhere else in the Scriptures. I see prophets put their name on promises all the time. I see the Savior put his name on promises all the time, but this is the one and only promise I can find that the Father puts his name on. 
And so Nephi quotes and says, if you are on that path, if you are pressing forward, feasting upon the word of God, love man, love God, obeying the first two commandments, and then comes the end, and you do that until the end. Now, this end has to be death. If you are on that simple path of moving forward when you die, here's the promise. Thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. You're not going to fall off the path in the spirit world. If you are moving forward, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and generally you're moving forward and you die, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. In the words of Bruce R. McConkie, for all intents and purposes, your calling and election has been made sure. Therefore, speaking of death and the conquering of the dragon and chaos and the monster, the psalm says in verse 15 of Psalm 116, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. There is something about dying on the path, moving forward towards him. In the words of Elder Ballard, life isn't over for any Latter-day Saint until we are safely dead. And that's a fascinating phrase. What does it mean to be safely dead? I think he's referring to that promise in the Book of Mormon that we died on the path moving forward and that our death, even if it is painful, is precious in the sight of the Lord. Powerful message. So now we're going to go back to Psalm 103. Psalm 103 talks a a bit about the Lord's people rejecting him. You see, even though the people rejected the Lord at Mount Sinai, he still blessed them. And those blessings are celebrated here in the 103rd Psalm. And in this Psalm, we find a sharp contrast between the loving kindness of God as laid out in the pre-exilic literature versus this unkind, mean God in many of the historical books of the Old Testament that were written by many post-exilic authors, scribes, and priests. You know, we don't know how much of it was edited and changed after the exile, but there's pretty strong evidence that quite a bit of the Bible has been edited after the exile. And so what we have in the 103rd Psalm, in my opinion, are examples of God's love and a lot of the depiction of how he is portrayed in the Book of Mormon. This God that has, well, look what it says, loving kindness and tender mercies. Let's just read the front end of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. That's who God is, verse 3, the God of healing. Verse 4, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with chesed, loving kindness, and rechemim, or rechem, as I like to say in English, tender mercies. That word rechem is the womb, and that word chesed is that word for God's loving kindness. Now, I know that the King James is saying that God is crowning us with these two things, but I want to just take a look at that word for crowneth, just briefly. That word, where it says God is crowning you, it can also be read as he is surrounding you with these things. This verse in Psalm 103 reminds me of this verse in the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 1, where Lehi says to his children, behold, the Lord has redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. Ritually, what is Lehi saying? I think what he's saying is he's been embraced by God. Liturgically, he would be in the Holy of Holies. And so Lehi is telling his children, as I have had this experience, so can you. I just think 2 Nephi 1 verse 15 should be marked in our scriptures right next to that verse, verse 4 of Psalm 103. And I love Psalm 103 verse 4. I just think that Lehi says it better. That's just me. But we, we read this, and then there's this shift in Psalm 103. We shift from describing God's character, and then it gets into the story of how the Lord made his will known to the Israelites through Moses, but even though they rejected him, God still loves them. And so I think Psalm 103 really lends itself to inviting us to think about 
well, who is God and what is he like? Now, as you read through this week's Come, Follow Me, I want you to notice phrases like that. You're going to see repeatedly the phrase tender mercies or kindness. You're going to see that emphasized as if to say, pay attention that God is a merciful being. And in light of that, I want to take everyone to lectures on faith, which I attribute to Joseph Smith. I think it's coming from the genius of Joseph Smith. In lecture three, it says that three things are necessary for any rational and intelligent person to have faith that leads to salvation. If you want saving faith, there are three requirements. Number one, the idea that he actually exists, and that's kind of an obvious one. You have to believe that he exists. But number two fascinates me. It says you have to have a correct understanding of his character, attributes, and perfections. If you don't have a correct understanding, it will affect your faith, and you will not have faith that leads to salvation. What they then do in the lectures is they talk about the character, that's lecture three, the attributes, that's lecture four, and the perfections, that's lecture five, of God that allow us to have faith that leads to salvation. Now, listed among his character is that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in goodness. Gee, I wonder where they got that phrase. Go back to Psalm 103. Let me read verse 8, and then I'm going to read Lectures on Faith, Lecture 3, verse 15. The psalm says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Lectures on Faith says, Second among his character is that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in goodness. They may be pulling this right out of Psalm 103. But then in their explanation— in lectures on faith, in explaining why Latter-day Saints must believe he is merciful, they state this, and I'm going to shout this out because I believe this is so true. It's true for me. It's true for so many people that I love. The explanation is, unless he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering, and full of goodness— such is the weakness of human nature, and so great the frailties and imperfections of men, that unless they believed that these excellencies existed in the divine character, the faith necessary to salvation could not exist, for doubt would take the place of faith, and those who know their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation if it were not for the idea which they have of the excellency of the character of God, that he is slow to anger and long-suffering and of a forgiving disposition and does forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. The idea of these facts does away doubt and makes faith exceedingly strong. End quote from Lectures on Faith. Now, I know my weakness and liability to sin, and I know so many of you are very aware of your weakness and your liability to sin, but we don't have to be in constant doubt of salvation. If we hold on with firm hands that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy, watch for that theme throughout the rest of these psalms, because it's going to be played over and over and over again. He's going to use phrases like tender mercy, which must have rung in Nephi's soul because he uses that same phrase, at least our English equivalent of it, in 1 Nephi chapter 1, the very first chapter of the small plates. He ends by saying, I'm going to show you that the tender mercies of the Lord are upon all those who, because of their faith, he has chosen to make them strong into deliverance. Watch for that and let it ring in your soul that he is slow to anger and abundant in mercy. That's good. We link that in the show notes. If you want to read lectures on faith and you want to read some of the things that Bryce was quoting, that's all there. So you can go and, and access that. Before we go to 110, and I know it's skipped and come follow me, I just want to talk about Psalm 105 for just a second. Psalm 105 talks about God working in the history of the children of Israel. So we read in verses 16 through 25 about Joseph and the famine and how God worked to save his children. 
And if you go to verse 26, it says, he sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. And then it talks about God's redemptive work with Israel through Moses. And then if you go to verse 39, it says, he spread a cloud for a covering, the fire to give light in the night. Verse 41, he opened the rock and the waters gushed out. And so it goes on and talks about God's redemptive work with Israel. And I do believe this. I believe that the story of the Exodus and the story of Israel's history was told at the temple. And I think depending on when you went and depending on what state of apostasy the Israelites were in, uh, they heard these stories. And I think that's one of the purposes of the temple is to find our bearings, to find, okay, where are we in history? And I know in our temples today, we don't retell the story of Moses. That story. But there is a story we retell that is kind of that same, look what God does for man. Yeah. Look at the lengths he's willing to go to bless and prosper and save his children. And, and it's the creation story. And I remember reading John Walton, this biblical scholar, and he's not LDS, but he talks about the creation narrative as it's contained in Genesis. He's adamant about this, where he says, this was told at the temple. The story of the creation is not to, supposed to be a scientific textbook saying exactly how things happened. It was a story to talk about God's redemptive work to his children. Why and, these things happen. Exactly. And it, it was a temple text. And so I remember reading that going, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And so the story of the creation is retold in different ways in the Psalms, but it's not like Genesis. And so there's a lot of scholars out there that say the reason why we don't have the creation story retold in the Psalms like it was in Genesis is because... Genesis was the story. Like they did tell that first part of Genesis with the creation at the temple. So these Psalms that cover and, and speak of the creation are hearkening back to the Genesis narrative of the creation. So with that in mind, let's go to Psalm 110. Now, Psalm 110 is not a long Psalm. But it is significant it is. because Jesus is significant and the role he plays is significant. And if you don't understand the connection, between Elohim and Jehovah. If you don't understand the position between the Father and the Son, you've missed a major doctrine and a major source of your salvation. It really is powerful in helping everyone understand who Jesus was. Psalm 110 is the most quoted text of the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. We actually have a page that we'll link in the show notes, so you can go check it out, where we show you, okay, here's the New Testament authors that are quoting it exactly. And then there's several allusions to Psalm 110. What I mean by allusions is where if you know Psalm 110 and you're reading the text by these different authors in the New Testament, you're like, oh, he's paraphrasing Psalm 110. And it's not a short list. Now, do you see their purpose? The New Testament writers were trying to say that Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy, that he was the Lord that the Lord was referring to. And if they can make that case that Jesus is Lord, then we really ought to follow him and let him be our Lord. Here's how it reads. The Lord has said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse two, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. That's it. That's Psalm 110. But what is it saying? Verse 1 says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. There's a couple ways we can read verse 1. One way to read it is this. The earthly king stood at the altar before the people, and there would be a priest who represented God, and the priest would say to the king, or the Lord, the priest who represents the Lord, would say to my Lord, Adoni, or my Lord, my earthly king, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. In other words, the earthly king that made the covenants with God would turn and face the audience, and then he would take his throne, and he would represent God to the people. But 
he also represented the people to God. And so the king on earth was kind of this conduit of power between heaven and earth. And the priest who represented God told the king to sit down. In other words, he's his right-hand man. Now, that's one way to read it. It is the Lord saying to the king, sit at my right hand. On another level, this is the Father, the Father in heaven, saying to Jehovah or Christ, sit at my right hand. You got to read Psalm 110 with Psalm 2. I think these two go together, and it's sad that they're so far apart, but I'm just going to reference this. In the second Psalm, this is what it says. Verse 6, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Remember, that's the temple, the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So the king becomes a son of God ritually. Now, this harkens up back to the story of King Benjamin, where the people all make the covenant. Remember, this is a coronation ceremony. This is a Thanksgiving situation where they come to the temple. They're all there in their booths or their tents surrounding the temple, and they become sons and daughters of Christ. Yeah. Mosiah chapter 5, verse 7, King Benjamin says, Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, you are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. So God says to Christ, you're my son. And then Christ says to us, you're my son, you're my daughter. That's just a beautiful connection. So you can see that in Psalm 110, verse 1, there's multiple readings. This is a multivalent passage. On one hand, it is the Lord saying to the king, sit at my right hand. On another level, this is the Father saying to Christ, sit at my right hand. And so the New Testament authors, and they're doing this all over the place because they're writing to Jews who know the story of the temple, and they know the old tradition before the apostasy. Remember, After the temple's destroyed in 586, we're not doing this anymore, we think. And the reason why we don't think they're doing this is because if they would be anointing a king and saying that the king is God's right-hand man, that would be an act of subversion to the nations that ruled over Israel. Like, they're just not doing this. And so Psalm 110 and Psalm 2, these ideas were lost through the apostasy, but the Book of Mormon authors and the New Testament authors understand it because the lens they're reading these passages through is Jesus. And Jesus is the Lord that is sitting on the right hand. And so what's going to happen? Verse 2 of Psalm 110, the rod of strength is going to come. We've got this ruler, this Messiah that is in the midst of thine enemies. And if there was ever a nation that was in the midst of their enemies, angel, it's Israel. And then we have the king who has, quote, the dew of his youth. And there's a lot of indication here that the king was young. Um, Clearly, Jesus died in the prime of his life. And then we read verse 4, that the Lord has sworn that the king is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what is that? Alma 13, it's this holy order that God had before the world was. Go back and read Alma 13, where this is explained in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon authors are into this idea that there's this order That's the order of the Son of God, the order of the priesthood, and that the king, the true king, will be a priest after this order. Then verse 5, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. And that's kind of what's going on in verse 5, 6, and 7. And the idea is, and we have a picture here on the Psalm 110 page where we talk about this, where it shows kings of antiquity, how they would literally step on the heads of their enemies and the enemies would bow down before them. This is a promise of invulnerability that was given to the kings anciently. Now, I don't take this stuff literally. I certainly don't see Jesus walking around putting his foot on people's heads, but we need to understand that in antiquity, the idea was if your king was the right-hand man of God, Everybody else had to bow down to the king. And so that's kind of the imagery that's taking place in verse 5, 6, and 7. He shall drink of the brook in the way, and he'll lift up his head, is this idea that the king has come back from battle, and he's drinking this water, and he's lifting up his head like, aha, I've been victorious. Other biblical scholars look at that and say, just as the Savior bowed his head when he was crucified, he lifts it up when he's resurrected. And there's some beautiful paintings by some really talented artists where it shows the Savior coming triumphantly 
out of the tomb and he's lifting up his head because the king has come to claim the throne. And so I see Psalm 110. I I know it can kind of be confusing, but understanding in its liturgical context, anciently, that this was at the setting of the temple and that the king represented God to the people. I mean, this is where we get this idea of divine right of kings that kind of went squampus in history. But the idea was, if the king was righteous and the people are keeping the covenant and he's keeping the covenant, then the land will be whole. And so we're kind of doing a close reading of this psalm, but then you got to back up. Yeah. If we back up a little bit, notice we use the phrase a great deal, king of kings. Jesus is the king of kings. So there's a connection here between King Jesus, who's the king of kings, and the king on earth, who's an earthly king. So there's a lot of depth here. Yeah. If we jump really, so if we jump really back, we see the Psalms show the purpose of everything. Now, I think it says it better here than it does in the Psalms, so bear with me. Just go to section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants and look in verse 15. In verse 15, we're talking about the spirit and body are the soul of man and the idea that the resurrection from the dead is the redemption of the soul and the redemption of the soul is through him that quickeneth all things. So now we're talking about Christ. That word for quicken is literally means to make alive in whose bosom it is decreed that the poor and the meek of the earth shall inherit it. So God is the God of widows and orphans. He loves them. So what are we talking about in verse 17? We're talking about the earth. Then we go to verse 18. Therefore it, the earth, must needs be sanctified from all unrighteousness, that it may be prepared for the celestial glory. For after it, the earth, has filled the measure of its creation, it, the earth, shall be crowned with glory even with the presence of God the Father. And then, verse 20, now we're, we're going from the earth, and now we're talking about you and me. That bodies who are of the celestial kingdom may possess it forever and ever. For this intent was it made and created, and for this intent are they sanctified. To me, verses 15 through 20 of the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants is the Psalms. Like the whole purpose, why do we have a king? Why do we have these laws? Why is he being anointed? And why are we doing all this stuff at the temple? It's because we're practicing coming into God's presence that God, verse 20, wants to make us sanctified. And I think a big part of it is just his presence. If we come into his presence, because it says he's coming. If you look in verse 19, it says that he, the father, is coming to the earth And the bodies who are of the celestial kingdom may possess the earth forever and ever. And the way I kind of read verse 20 is just coming into the Father's presence is going to change us. And so this temple drama was a way to portray these ideas. And I see a lot of the temple drama just in the sacrament. A big part of it was when they would eat and drink and make covenants to come unto God. So that's kind of big picture stuff. Sorry, I just wanted to do a quick look at what's going on overall in the Psalms, but know that we're kind of diving deep in Psalm 110 with this idea of the king. But really, to the New Testament authors, that was important because that was Jesus. Now, I'm going to take that theme and jump to 118. We kind of did 116. 117 is just two verses about the merciful kindness of the Lord. But in 118, speaking of this conquering hero, speaking of that the Lord is at the right-hand side of God, that Jesus is this cornerstone, there was a prophecy uttered in this ritual that the Book of Mormon begs us to personalize and apply in our life. So I just want to jump to verse 22 of 118. I think this single verse is extremely significant, and it comes at a setting where the king's going to be rejected. The king is going to fall victim to his enemies, and then he's going to come back. And in the middle of that, which we'll come back to in a second, is the prophecy that the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Now, the New Testament authors will quote that many times, saying, you Jews rejected Jesus, and he's the corner. But that theme of rejecting him, rejecting the one who sits on the right hand of God, the Book of Mormon picks that up. Now, Lehi saw a tree, he saw a building, he saw mist, a river, he saw a rod, he saw the symbolic version of the tree of life. 
And we learn that the tree is the love of God. The building is the imitation. It's the pride of the world, the vain and fancy things that people think will make them happy. The mist blinds our eyes and hardens our hearts. The river we drowned in and the rod helps us get to the tree and help us avoid the building. But then Nephi wanted to know more. And the brilliance of the Lord is that he didn't show Nephi a tree, a rod, a building, a mist, and a river. He told Nephi stories, three stories. And he basically said, can you find each one of these in the story? Can you find the tree in the story? Can you find the building in the story? Can you find the rod? Now, the first story the Lord told Nephi is found in 1 Nephi chapter 11, and it's what you and I would refer to as the New Testament. The Lord told Nephi the story of the New Testament, and Nephi instantly recognized that the tree was the birth of Christ. The tree is the manifestations of God's love, and there was no greater manifestation than the birth of Christ. So in that spirit, the Book of Mormon is asking us to say, what was the mist of darkness? What blinded the eyes and hardened the hearts of those who crucified Christ in the New Testament? And the answer is, he wasn't the Messiah they wanted him to be. He didn't do what they wanted him to do. They wanted a military Messiah that would conquer their earthly enemies like Rome. And he was not going to do that. And he told them he wasn't going to do that. And yet, I kind of want to give him a pass because so many messages in the Psalms and in the Old Testament portray the cosmic king as destroying his enemies. Yeah, if you don't make the right connection to which one is going to come in mortality and which one's going to come at the end of the world, you're going to mix that up. I think how we read the text matters. Sometimes just a healthy dose of being open to maybe we're not reading it the way it was to be read. I think it's just good to be open and say to ourselves, okay, maybe I'm not 100% right on this. Because, Bryce, you know, we, we're going to talk about this when we get to Acts. After Jesus is resurrected in Acts chapter 1, the apostles are like, well, you're resurrected, Lord. Let's do it. Let's end this. And the Lord's like, I'm not here. To, I'm not doing that. I'm not taking Rome out. Yeah. But that's what they wanted. Yeah. And so they read the scriptures, and they expected a Messiah to come and conquer their earthly enemies, conquer hunger, conquer poverty, conquer Rome's conquest. And Jesus came and said, I'm here to conquer sin and death. Now, in John chapter 6, when he announces that, that I am not going to do what you think I'm going to do, I am not that Messiah, verse 60, many of them utter, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? And I think the Book of Mormon is presenting this in such a way that it is begging us to say, are we one of those? Are we one of those who, when Jesus doesn't do what you think he should do, when he doesn't conquer the things you expect him to conquer, are you going to say, this is too hard? And then John chapter 6, verse 66 says, many of his disciples walked away, walked no more with him, because he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. Now, luckily, Jesus turns to the 12 and says, are you going to walk away? And Peter says, where would I go? And I think we need to be that kind of people. But the theme the Book of Mormon seems to be emphasizing is, are you going to walk away? Are you going to reject the stone that is really the corner? Because it's not what you expect. Jesus doesn't make all of our problems go away. He doesn't heal every disease. He allows us to suffer for reasons that he understands and maybe we don't. But we have this expectation of what Christ is supposed to do. We also have that expectation of what Christ's church is supposed to be like. If this is Christ's church, then we have this expectation of perfection. And when we find that it's not perfect, are you going to walk away? And that seems to be a major theme, and it was presented in the temple drama in the Old Testament. Now, the fact that they would, during that temple ritual, shout out that warning ought to stand as a warning to each one of us. Be careful that you're not rejecting the cornerstone. I raise that warning voice to all of us. I've watched way too many people walk away from him and reject the cornerstone because he didn't do what they thought he should do. 
eyewitness of a Messiah that does what is best for us, not necessarily what we think is best for us. That's a good message. I really like Psalm 118. I think that liturgically this was given or sung as part of the drama when the king came back from battle. And so just a couple things we can see in Psalm 118. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. That's verse 1. Verse 5, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Skip down to Psalm 118, verse 10. All nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. Verse 19, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go in unto them, and I will praise the Lord. So the idea is that liturgically, the king's coming with the ark, the gates are opening. He's telling the Israelites that he's been redeemed. I see this liturgically as part of the drama as after the king has been brought back from the dead, and he is telling everyone that it's going to be okay. Verse 28 reads, Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. By the way, that's a song. There's a song by uh, this group called Casting Crowns, and that's one of their songs. It's just so beautiful. Anyway, Psalm 118 is this beautiful idea that the kings come back and that everything's going to be okay. But I think that the New Testament authors really keyed in on what Bryce is talking about with verse 22, because the stone was rejected. And the stone that they rejected was the cornerstone. And forgive me, I'm not an engineer, but I had a friend who explained this to me, where he said that that cornerstone is kind of the ground zero, where they base all the measurements of the building from somewhere. They have to pick a spot, and so they pick the cornerstone. It's kind of like the X, Y axis, if you're a mathematician, that zero point where the X and Y intersect. In other words, we find our bearings, and we have to figure out you know, where are we going to start from, and it's the cornerstone. I think this is interesting, too, that at least in the northern hemisphere, that southeast cornerstone is where they put that first stone because it's the place of most light. There's a lot of scholars out there that talk about that they actually have a brick building ceremony where the first brick is built or put together by the king because that first brick kind of represents the totality of the building project. And so if you've ever been to like a groundbreaking ceremonies and they turn the first earth with that shovel, that kind of represents that idea that the person who's in charge shows up for that because... It just indicates that that, that ceremony is, is, is significant, and it's trying to draw our hearts and our minds towards asking questions about purpose. Yeah. Now, Psalm 119, if you are a literature nerd, if you love poetry or language or the play on words— you would have loved Psalm 119 in its original language. It's a brilliant tribute to God. But here, many of us kind of struggle with first the length of it and then the structure of it. Mike, break it down for us. Well, I'm not going to get too into this, but just know that it is an acrostic, and you can kind of tell because Psalm 119 verses 1 through 8, you'll see that little Aleph, that's the first character in Hebrew, and every one of those verses starts with Aleph. And so the word for blessed in in Hebrew is Asherah, which is going to remind us of Asherah or the tree. We'll talk about that when we get to Proverbs. So Asherah are the undefiled. Asherah are those that keep his testimonies. And then you get to verse 9, and you do verse 9 to 16, and it starts with bait. And so um, literally in the, in the very beginning, wherewithal, in the Hebrew, it's bemar. It's in what? In what shall a young man cleanse his way? And then you go to verse 17 to verse 24, starts with Gimel, the third. And you get the idea. It goes from Aleph all the way to Tau. Or in, in Greek, it would be Alpha to Omega. And in English, it would be A to Z. And the idea is um, this was a scribal exercise. Scribes could practice their writing and they could really get into it. But it's also beautiful and it's poetry. The whole Psalm, Psalm 119, is a prayer to God. And we think it could be read as spoken by a young king who was about to die in the heat of battle. And so the greatest portion of Psalm 119 is a series of reminders to God and no doubt to the king as well, as he engages in his struggle against chaos, of his piety and his devotion to God. So here's a couple examples. Skip down to verse 26. 
Verse 26 reads, I have declared my ways, thou heardest me, teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the ways of thy precepts, so I shall talk of thy wondrous works. Uh, we'll skip down to verse 71 as well. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. So these expressions of devotion are sometimes intertwined with desperate pleas for assistance. Only once the young king's thought pattern was interrupted, when he addressed an adversary, perhaps during a, a scene of intense swordplay, do we read something like this. Uh, go to Psalm 119, verse 115. Depart from me, evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. So the young king's world was coming down all around him, but he didn't cower before his enemies, but he was determined to stay alive. So go to verse 75. I know we're jumping around, but verse 75 says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. Verse 76, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness will be for my comfort. Verse 77, let thy tender mercies come unto me. Mike, it kind of sounds like Moroni when he's wandering alone, fighting off the enemy, saying, boy, if I make myself known to the Lemonites, they'll kill me because they put to death everyone who will d- won't deny the Christ. And I, Moroni, will not deny the Christ. It's kind of that fight against evil, but a plea for God to protect him. I hear that as I read Psalm 119. Yeah, you mentioned Moroni, and then and then as soon as you said that, I thought of Nephi, where Nephi says, my brothers want to kill me. Is that 2 uh, Nephi 3? Yeah, in 2 Nephi 3, where he's like, my brothers want to kill me. Um, go to verse 94. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me. And so there's this tension happening throughout the psalm. One thing I love is that he says, look, Lord, I have held on to thy law. I love that he points out to scripture and law and commandment. In verse 97 of 119, he says, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. In 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse 127, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. 128, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. He's basically saying to all of us in this struggle, as you're fighting off the darkness, hold on to the iron rod. Hold on to God's commandments, his law, his words, everything that he commands us to do. You hold on to that, and you're going to be okay, as I have been. Now, in the midst of this being a temple drama, we see this as the king or the hero. But think about some of your favorite movies. When I teach teenagers, I talk about Little Mermaid. There was a time when the mermaid is in the clutches of Ursula. And everything is just coming down on her. And if you think about your favorite dramas, that's what makes it a drama. That tension is what heightens the experience. Look in verse 146. I cried unto thee, save me. Verse 135. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Verse 132. Look thou upon me. I mean, as Ariel cries out, I mean, for those of you that are Disney fans, But in the drama of the ages, the temple drama, remember that the king represents Jesus. And so that's kind of the height of the New Testament gospel writers. These writers that write this good news, the tension is heightened when he's in Gethsemane and on the cross. What's going to happen? And you're at this moment of incredible emotion where you, you have this great feeling for the Savior as he goes through the suffering. And we read a lot of that tension in the Psalms, especially in Psalm 119. And the Savior is delivered from death, and he delivers us. And so, skip to the end of Psalm 119, verse 169. Let my prayer come near before thee, O Lord. Verse 170. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. Verse 174. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live and it shall praise thee. So these last words of the psalm strike the final chord of the young king's time on earth and express his hope that will one day become the ultimate triumph of the entire festival drama. This was his testimony of who Jehovah is. I mean, that's the last phrase there. And it talks about his knowledge and his understanding that Jehovah has the ultimate authority. 
and his anticipation that the atonement's going to save him and that he knew that only God could save him. And so I think if we read Psalm 119 this way as part of the drama, as part of the king praying for deliverance, I think it's beautiful, but I think it's even better if we read it as it being Jesus. But remember, liturgically, the people that went to the temple were seeing that this was also their story. And so like Bryce has talked about before, if you have someone in your life that's going through and walking through the valley of the shadow of death, the Psalms have more meaning because, well, we're being compassed by by these horrible experiences. And so I think the Psalms can have relevance depending on what you're going through. And I think that that's why many people have used them to make songs and they have depth to them. They have a feeling to them that I think when you put these to music, it even heightens the experience. We are now going to leave Psalm 119. 127 is next, yeah. but that's going to skip a great deal. And in between, we have what we call songs of ascent. Yeah. Starting in Psalm 120, right beneath the chapter heading, Call Upon the Lord When in Distress, it says, A Song of Degrees. Probably a better way to read that is A Psalm of Ascent. And that's actually in the Masoretic text, A Psalm of Ascent. And there's 15 of them, Psalm 120 to 134. And I know we're not covering this in Come Follow Me, but I want to just talk about it briefly. These Psalms of Ascent, we think, were in conjunction with what's called the water drawing ceremony. It's also called the water libation in in some scholarship. And what this is, is this is, we think, put to music, and it was used when the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam. So now remember, we talked about this back when we talked about Hezekiah's tunnel. Hezekiah's tunnel dug a hole through the mountain down into what's called the spring of Gihon. And so this spring that where water sprang up from underground went through this tunnel and descended into this pool, which was within the walls of Jerusalem. And this beautiful pool had this water that came, that sprang from the rock. And the priests would go down and they would gather it, and then they would ascend and eventually go to the water gate, and then they would pour the water from the Pool of Siloam onto the altar at the temple. And the idea was, underneath the altar, there was the deep, the Tihom, this cavernous structure where there were waters in the deep, way, way down underwater. Now, I geek way more out about this in the show notes than I'm going to do in this podcast, so just bear with me. I'm going to say a lot of stuff, and you're like, what is Mike talking about? Just go and read it in the show notes. It's in there, I promise. So here's kind of the idea. The idea was that when David conquered the Jebusites and he kicked them off the mount, And he came to this rock, and there's a couple accounts. One, he kicks him out, and then the other account says that he purchased the rock, the threshing floor. That's in the scriptures. But then there's this oral tradition that when he got to the threshing floor, that he dug under it, and he accidentally removed this stone that basically was this pin that held the waters of the deep down. And when he moved the stone, the waters of the deep were coming up, and he kind of panicked because he's like, what's going to happen if I don't fix this, the waters of the deep are going to take over the world. And so in tradition, what happened was he took the holy ineffable name of God and put it on a stone and put that stone down and kind of pinned the waters of the deep down. But when he did it, the name of God was so powerful that the waters of the deep descended 16,000 cubits. And the idea was that that, that's too far. We can't have the waters of the deep that far. We won't have water. And so the 15 songs of ascent are that when they sing each one of them, that the waters of the deep come up slowly, a thousand cubits each time. But not we don't want it 16,000. We don't want to overtake the world. So the waters come back up. And when they pour the water libation on the altar, that water trickles down and goes down to the deep. And it invokes healing. Now, Bryce and I are going to talk about this a ton when we get to Ezekiel, but the water libation ceremony is that story. In Ezekiel, he has this vision that waters come up from the deep underneath the temple and that they go all the way and heal the Dead Sea and go all the way west and go to the Great Sea of the Mediterranean and make everything a paradisical experience in that land. And if you've been to Israel, a lot of it isn't paradisical. It's kind of hot. But that idea of the waters of the deep being connected with the Pool of Siloam and being under the auspices of the priesthood. And once again, they're in a circle around the altar. They're doing some dancing and they're doing some things liturgically. They are invoking God's power to bring fertility back. And so then I I just think this is so cool because we read this statement by Christ 
in John 7, Jesus at the ceremony, when they're doing the libation ceremony, makes this statement. If any man might thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that has faith in me, ho pisteon. In other words, those that trust him or have faith in him or believe in him, according to that which is written, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. We're going to flow out of them. And that's a powerful statement because the Jews at this ceremony at the time, that's the, the situation where Jesus is explaining this. He's saying he is the living water. And he says, if we drink his water, out of us will flow living water. Now, the idea is out of the belly of the earth, the waters of the deep are going to come out. And Jesus is saying, you will be fertile. You will have seed. You will have wonderful non deserty type life if you come unto me. So I love John 7, 37 and 38. And I love that Jesus gave that speech at the time when this is going on. And so to me, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, this idea of the water drawing ceremony in conjunction with Jesus' statements, and then you get into some of the insane geek out moments in the show notes where there's all this tradition. Like, guys, I don't believe necessarily that there's 16,000 underneath the ground water and it's coming up a thousand cubits every time. I don't like literally believe this, but mythically it's awesome. This is so awesome. And Jesus knows this stuff and he's quoting this stuff. And it's just kind of a couple verses of the New Testament. But if you know the backstory, you're like, Jesus knows his stuff. I guess that's kind of my point. So with that, let's go to Psalm 127. Now, as we're doing these Psalms of Ascension, as we're at the temple, as we've come to celebrate and we've come to participate I think families had some role in the ceremony. Now, if King Benjamin's speech at the temple is, in fact, a pattern of this Feast of Tabernacles celebration at the temple, then it's significant that the Book of Mormon points out that they came as families. I'm going to read Mosiah 2, verse 5. It came to pass that when they came up to the temple, they pitched their tents around about, every man according to his family, consisting of his wife and his sons and his daughters, and their sons and their daughters from the eldest down to the youngest, every family being separate one from another. So this was an act of families coming together to worship at the temple, which is kind of fun idea that when we go to the temple, we often gather as families. But it's in that setting that families were gathering that we have this beautiful Psalm 127. As we're staring at the temple ceremony, it gives us a moment to pause and stare down at our children and think about their role and our connection to them in all of this temple drama. So Psalm 127 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. What a beautiful moment in the temple to pause and realize that the greatest blessings of my life are here with me. And that because of that temple, this family can carry on for eternity. And if I'm going to spend eternity with anyone, I want it to be these very people. And so we, we pause and we rejoice in our children. Jen and I have 10 of them, and they are the very delight of our lives. And now that we have grandchildren, now we know the joy that God must have in his posterity. Because my greatest moments in life are when I'm with my children and my grandchildren. I love President Kimball where he says, a century ago, men were following with bated breath the march of Napoleon and waiting with feverish impatience for news about the war. And all the while in their homes, babies were being born. But who could think about babies? Everybody was thinking about battles. In one year between Trafalgar and Waterloo, there stole into the world a host of heroes, Gladstone was born in Liverpool, Tennyson at Summersby, Oliver Wendell Holmes in Massachusetts, Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky, and music was enriched by the advent of Felix Mendelssohn in Hamburg. We might add, and Joseph Smith was born in Vermont four years earlier. But nobody thought of babies. Everybody was thinking about battles. Yet which of the battles of 1809 mattered more than the babies of 1809? 
We fancy God can manage his world only with great battalions, when all the time he is doing it with beautiful babies. When a wrong wants writing, or a truth wants preaching, or a continent wants discovering, God will send a baby into the world to do it. He commanded Adam, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And as the psalmist sang, lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. Happy is the man that has a quiver full of them. That's President Kimball. And he said that in 1960. And I love this one, Mike, from Neil A. Maxwell in 1978. He said, when the real history of mankind is fully disclosed, will it feature the echoes of gunfire or the shaping sound of lullabies? The great armistices made by military men or the peacemaking of women in homes and in neighborhoods? Will what happened in cradles and kitchens prove to be more controlling than what happened in Congresses? When the surf of the centuries has made the great pyramids so much sand, the everlasting family will still be standing because it is a celestial institution formed outside of telestial time. That's good. Psalm 135 talks about Israel's history from the council of heaven to the reign of David. We read in verse 4 that the Lord has chosen Israel for his peculiar treasure. And then we read in verse 5, I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. This is casting our mind back to the premortal council, that there are many Elohim, there are many divine beings, but the Lord is preeminent. Or in the words of Abraham, there were many noble and great ones, but the greatest is Jesus. But don't be deceived because here on earth, there are many who pretend to be great and they posturize themselves as being great and and that we should follow them. And so starting in verse 15, it says, beware of the imitation kind of by saying, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. I think that's a warning that God is great and that there are many noble and great ones that will guide us to God. But don't be fooled by the wrong kinds of great because they really have no power to save us. In that spirit, Elder Bruce R. McConkie once said in General Conference, there is no salvation in worshiping a false god. It does not matter one particle how sincerely someone may believe that God is a golden calf or that he is an immaterial, uncreated power that is in all things. The worship of such a being or concept has no saving power. Men may believe with all their souls that images or powers or laws are God. But no amount of devotion to these concepts will ever give the power that leads to immortality and eternal life. If a man worships a cow or a crocodile, he can gain any reward that cows and crocodiles happen to be passing out this season. If he worships the laws of the universe or the forces of nature, no doubt the earth will continue to spin, the sun to shine, and the rains to fall upon the just and on the unjust. But if he worships the true and living God in spirit and in truth, then God Almighty will pour out his spirit upon them. He will have power to raise the dead, move mountains, entertain angels, and walk in celestial streets. That's a good message. I think structurally in this psalm, we really, once we get past the beginning of the Grand Council, when you get to verse 8 and 9, It shows us God saving Israel out of Egypt. Then you get to verse 10. That's the conquest of the Holy Land. And then you get to verse 21. That's the reign of David. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. But I also think that 21 could be future. So remember, these Psalms are packaged. There's a lot of these in here we've covered already before that kind of cover God's working with Israel through history. And maybe they use different ones at different times. I, you know, I doubt they read all the historical ones in one setting, but maybe they did. But I see this as kind of repackaging some of these ideas. Now, the 136th Psalm is continuing their history from the Grand Council of Heaven and beyond. And so it kind of goes, it's kind of interesting if you go to the first three verses. The first verse is addressing Jehovah, but then 
verse two is addressing the father, but then verse three is addressing Jehovah again. And so we got this premortal council stuff going on in these verses. Verse one says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. That's Jesus or Jehovah. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods. Um, that could be El Elyon, or that could be what we as Latter-day Saints would call Elohim, or the Father, for his mercy endureth forever. And then verse 3, O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. And then we get to the creative works of God. Verse 5, he made the heavens. Verse 6, he made the earth and the great lights and the sun and the moon and the stars. And then verse 10, he smote Egypt and then on and on. He divides the sea in the 12th and 13th verses. And then the enemies of Israel are destroyed in 15 through 21. And then over and over again, it talks about his hesed endures forever. In other words, his mercy just goes into the eternities over and over again. It's beautiful. Now, I do want to say this about Psalm 137. So I, I certainly don't take it literally. Uh, there's some pretty violent stuff going on in 137, but I think it's very moving emotionally. Verse 1 of Psalm 137 reads, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on the willows in the midst thereof. For they that carried us captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of your songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? You see, this isn't a psalm of exile. The Jews are in exile. They're in Babylon, and they can't sing because the temple's been destroyed. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. They're so sad that the temple's been destroyed. And so they say, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. In other words, the Edomites, their enemies, were cheering as the Babylonians destroyed the temple and as they destroyed the city. Now, raise it is an R-A-I-S-E, as in lift it up. It's raise it, R-A-S-E, as in tear it down. Tear it down, yeah. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. I mean, this, this is a dark moment. It this is. is the moment of the movie where everything seems lost and we just don't know how to move forward and we can't sing because of the heaviness of our hearts. That's what's happening here. So in that temple drama, there must have been that melancholy, all hope is lost. What do we do now? That then leads us to the moment where God is victorious over the darkness. And yet it's drenched in violence and tragedy. I mean, verse 9 is a violent verse about dashing the Babylonian children against the stones. The author of this psalm is very much wrenched with pain and anguish. And I must say, I just want to share a personal experience I had. Uh, My first time going to the Western Wall, as I was approaching it, on the right-hand side as you're descending the stairs and you come down to where you're about to approach the Western Wall, Psalm 137 was there. And it was in Hebrew, and then there was an English translation. And I literally could feel it. I could feel the power of the place. And I was overcome with emotion with these people that lived anciently that just longed for the temple, these people that so desperately want to have the temple back. And so whether you're a Christian or whether you're Jewish, this site, this place has significance to these individuals. Now, I know the Temple Mount also has significance to our Islamic brothers and sisters. It's a very powerful place. And so I have what I call holy envy for the individuals that go there, but I also feel a connection to it because I, I love the scriptures and I feel the, the feeling that these people have about the destruction of the temple. And as a Latter-day Saint, I also cheer thinking, God in heaven hasn't forgotten his children. He still knows the sons of Israel. In that moment of darkness, when they're just mourning over the loss of the temple, I can't help but go forward in time, but backwards in the scriptures to Ezra. After the Babylonian captivity was over and the Jews are sent back to Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple, there's this beautiful little moment in Ezra. I'm going to read it. It's in Ezra chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. 
They sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. The contrast of the tears they shed at the loss of the temple and the tears they shed when that temple is brought back and the foundation is laid. I'm going to put two pictures in the show notes as a contrast to show you. If I could put an image on this, I'm going to put a picture of my oldest son leaving on a mission and his younger brother holding him and weeping because he's leaving. And then I'm going to put another picture in the show notes of that same younger brother weeping when his older brother came home from a mission. I want you to contrast those two tears. I want you to see the darkness of the day he left and the joy of the day he returned. And I think that to me captures this temple drama perfectly. The, sh- the, the, the weeping and the shedding of tears at the destruction of the temple, and then the weeping and the shedding of tears when a new foundation was laid and a temple was coming back. Thank you. Excellent. Psalm 138 is a Thanksgiving prayer of praise. Verse 7 reads, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. And then later in the verse it says, Thy right hand shall save me. So, next, Psalm 139, meditating on God's power. Verse 23 reads, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This psalm asserts the king's worthiness to approach God. The veil before which the king stood was like the one Moses had made for the tabernacle, if you go back to Exodus 26, 31, except this one in Solomon's temple was much larger. It was made of fine white linen with cherubim embroidered on it in threads of blue, purple, and crimson. We read that in 2 Chronicles 3. Skip to Psalm 146. This is the message about the work that Jehovah would do. This is the message of the angel to King Benjamin. Before his sermon to the people, King Benjamin was awakened at night by an angel. And this angel may have quoted bits of Psalm 146. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles drama carried two messages. The first, and the easiest to recognize, was that the biography of everyone is told through the story of the king. We are the king. Adam is us. Eve is us. Every one of us in our lives is told in the story in this great drama of the ages. But remember, the king also represents the Savior. And so the second message was that the king was parallel to and therefore representative of Jesus, Jehovah, who was the Messiah and the resurrected Christ. And so the angel, when the angel spoke to King Benjamin, may have quoted bits of Psalm 146. How do we know? Well, look at what's happening in Psalm 146. We read in verse 7 that the Lord executes judgment for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and looses the prisoners. In verse 8, we read that the Lord opens the eyes of the blind and raises up those who are bowed down. And then in verse 9, the Lord relieves the fatherless and the widow. And then finally, verse 10, the Lord shall reign forever. Knowing this, and then reading what the angel tells King Benjamin, look at this. Go to Mosiah 3, verse 5. For behold, the time cometh and is not far distant, that with power the Lord omnipotent, who reigneth, who was, and is from eternity to eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men, and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay, and shall go forth amongst men, working mighty miracles, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, 
causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases. And he shall cast out devils, or the evil spirits which dwell in the hearts of the children of men. And so we see some of these ideas, that he goes forth, and that he is opening the eyes of the blind in verse 8, giving food to the hungry, and executing judgment for the oppressed. And that he's going to reign. I really see a connection here between the message and the mission of Christ and the message and mission that King Benjamin relates to his people. And then I think, okay, well, what does it mean for us as Latter-day Saints? Can we execute judgment or fairness for the oppressed? Can we give food to the hungry? And King Benjamin even says, are we not all beggars? We need to do that. We need to find a way that we can, verse 8, open the eyes of the blind. And verse 9, preserve the strangers and relieve the fatherless and the widow. So it's, it's really beautiful. Okay, next. I think a great way to read Psalm 148 is to see this as God's power in creation. And I mean, I have to say this, go to verse seven. He's got the power over the deeps and the dragons. So you, you got to do that. But then go to Psalm 149. Psalm 149 and Psalm 150 are the last two Psalms. And to me, they indicate that the temple drama was participatory in nature. Now, this is a scholar by the name of Aubrey Johnson. He said this, apparently Psalm 149 introduces the worshipers as themselves sharing in this ritual performance. What is more, we have to note that they are summoned to sing a new song. And this, one need hardly say, is a thought which is particularly appropriate to our festival with its exultant anticipation of a new era of universal dominion and national prosperity. That's Aubrey Johnson. In other words, with the temple and with the new year, God is going to fix broken things, and the people are going to praise him, and the the land will have fertility, and there will be peace. The saints will sing and be joyful, and that the people participated in this celebration. I love it. So we just covered a ton of stuff, and there's a lot we didn't do. And just know that the Psalms are really worth pondering. They're worth your consideration. But I think the big picture, if we were to pull way back after these three weeks of Come Follow Me covering the Psalms, I think if we pull way back, we can see God's redemptive work with his people. It was used or portrayed in the setting of a drama at the temple. It's probably fair to say that the endowment is an abbreviated version of the Feast of Tabernacles temple drama. And what do we do in the temple? We get our bearings. We learn who God is. We learn about Jesus. We covenant to follow him. And the promise is, if we do that, the Lord will bless us and we'll have the blessings of resurrection, eternal marriage, eternal families, and we'll come back into the presence of God. And so I think that would be a big picture of these three weeks. And yet, these Psalms have gone deep down into looking at specifics up close. But if we don't know the big picture, we could get lost in the details. May you find great peace in these psalms as you journey back into Heavenly Father's presence and into His arms, where you will say that He has redeemed you from death, from tears, and from falling. And with that, we'll see you next time when we cover selections from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.